you burn them out, they will never love literature. That will make it the kiss of death. We want them to fall in love with books first. You're listening to the Read Aloud Revival Podcast. This is the podcast that inspires you to build your family culture around books. Hey, 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 Sarah McKenzie here. You're listening to episode 51 of the Read Aloud Revival. I'm so glad you're here. It is always a privilege to have you join us. I've got so much to tell you today. First of all, I want you to know that we are doing an awesome giveaway on Instagram. Are you following the Read Aloud Revival on Instagram? Because if you're not, you totally should. It's my new favorite place to play. Well, not really new. It's just my favorite place to play. In fact, I love doing giveaways so often on Instagram, my team has to rein me back. (laughs) Right now, though, we have an awesome giveaway happening with Grace Laced. I don't know if you know Ruth Chow Simons from gracelaced.com. She's a phenomenal artist, a beautiful person, and we are uh, pairing up to bring you some of her beautiful prints that will help you keep your eyes on what matters most, along with a signed copy of my book, Teaching from Rest, A Homeschooler's Guide to Unshakable Peace. You could win a set of what we're giving away for yourself as well as for a friend. And I am instagram.com slash read aloud revival. And Ruth is instagram.com slash grace laced. So don't miss out on the fun there. That giveaway is about to wrap up. So if you're listening to this podcast soon after we release, you can still jump in on it. And even if you miss that giveaway because you're not listening to this podcast right away, make sure you follow on Instagram because I'm giving something away every couple weeks. (laughs) I can't help myself. (laughs) Okay, so the other thing I wanted to let you know about is for those of you who really enjoyed S.D. Smith's The Green Ember, his uh, next book, Ember Falls is now available. It released on September 13th, and you can go to amazon.com or to storywarren.com to get your hands on that. If you're a Read Aloud Revival member, don't forget you have a discount code inside membership. So go into your member dashboard, look at the resource library, and you'll find the discount code there, and that will give you a discount off of your purchase, which is pretty spectacular. I don't want to keep you any longer because today's guest radiates joy and enthusiasm. You're going to adore her. If you haven't heard her already, you're going to love her by the end of this episode. Let's go find out why. Today's guest first joined us on episode 22 of the Read Aloud Revival podcast, and we have heard from so many of you that she put your hearts at ease. I am thrilled to welcome back Carol Joy Side. Carol is a well-loved speaker and consultant who helps parents make homeschooling and raising children simple, enjoyable, and affordable. She has a Bachelor of Arts in Fine Arts and a Master's Degree in Education and has taught in preschool, elementary, and junior high classrooms in both public and Christian schools. And of course, she's a veteran homeschooler. At the heart of Carol's educational philosophy is a simple idea. Books, books, and more books. And today she is joining us to talk about the golden age of children's literature. Carol, thank you so much for joining us again. We are thrilled to have you. Oh, I'm more thrilled to be here. Thank you, Sarah. Well, refresh your memories a bit, or for those who haven't heard episode 22 yet, and tell us a bit about your family and your work. Mm. Well, we were blessed with just one son, which was a heartbreak at the time, but God had, you know, wonderful plans. He's now pastoring and has soon to be four small children that are just the most delightful things in the world. <laughs> and <laughs> Not that you're partial or anything. <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> and they are well-read in being read too, I should say. They can't read yet, but they're well-read children. And the ministry that the Lord kind of threw me into just came out of teaching women's Bible studies and mentoring younger moms and myself, even just a couple years younger at the time, and just opened the doors for me to begin speaking nationally about my passion for books and reading aloud to children and how that can just change your children's character, their intelligence, their spiritual destiny. And it's just like a fire burning in my bones. And I've been doing it about 29 years now. I started when I was 12. So it's been a wonderful, wonderful ride. And as you know, Sarah, when you can 
reproduce a vision in other families and then they take it and run with it, you feel like, wow, that is a life well lived. I I can die at peace. (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So we are going to talk about the golden age of children's books. Tell us about that. What is the golden age? When was it? And Mm -hmm. yeah, just give us a little history on that. Well, some people, I mean, everyone has an opinion on that. Some people feel that it was really kind of early in the century, like around the turn of the century, you know, like Beatrix Potter's era, Wind in the Willows, A.A. Milne's era, you know, like, for example, Edith Nesbitt was writing in the 1900s, 1902. Peter Rabbit was written in 1902. Also, Little Princess, 1905, Wind in the Willows, 1908. So, Pooh was written 1926, though, and then like Little House, 1932. But for me personally, Sarah, although we're going to talk about some of those books, too, if you don't mind, I really feel that there was a wonderful period right after World War I and into World War II, that that is one of my favorite periods of children's literature. It just, I think the idea of family stories really came into it. A lot of wonderful history books were written in that period. Children were not being preached to. It wasn't this kind of goody two shoes writing. I mean, that literally was a character in, you know, in the Victorian era or before the Victorian era. Goody two shoes was her name, if you can just picture that. But anyway, (laughs) I'm sure (laughs) very inspiring to these children. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Oh, my. The children were probably burning the book when their parents went out. But it was, you know, gag me. It was just they were always, you know, sermonizing and laying a trip on children that if they don't you know, practice the Sabbath, bears were going to come out of the woods and eat them and things. <laughs> and so, you know, that was the early years of childhood writing for kids. And then, you know, someone like Louise May Alcott came along during the Civil War and wrote a book that treated children with respect, as Charlotte Mason would have been so happy about, that she treated children as though they were intelligent and uh, were not to be spoken down to. And so she really changed the era. And the way that people wrote children's books, Louise May Alcott really did that. And it came out of her father's philosophy, Bronson Alcott. And he was friends with Thoreau and Longfellow and everybody. And they all lived in Massachusetts together. But then as the years wore on, you know, some great stuff came out of England. But then when America really kind of jumped on the bandwagon, I feel was more after World War I, where we started writing some of my favorite children's books. So can I just jump in and start talking about some authors? Do oh, you mind? please do. Yes. Okay, great. So I thought I'd start with someone who is just in my, like when I get to heaven, I just am going to look for her. Her <laughs> name is Eleanor Estes. Oh, and yes. um, <laughs> you're familiar with her, I'm sure, yes. but some of your listeners may not be. She was raised in Connecticut and her dad worked for the railroad and her mother was a dressmaker. And when she was a married woman, she got tuberculosis and was bed, you know, she was put to bed, basically. And during that time, she wrote a book about her own childhood, really, but did it in such a creative and zesty way. And that was her first book, and it was called The Moffats. And it was based on her childhood. She set it in a fictional town called Cranberry. But she based it on her life, her brothers and sisters and her mother being a dressmaker and her dad died when she was a little girl. So really based on her own childhood. I didn't realize it. I love that book, but I did not realize it was based on her childhood. How incredible. Isn't that great? Yeah, Mm -hmm. I love knowing little details like that and telling children because children, the number one question they always ask is what? Is this true or is this real? Uh Right. So. I love when we can give kids some information about the authors and the illustrators. It makes it more personal, you know, for our kids. So she wrote a series of books on the Moffat family. And my favorite is The Middle Moffat that I consider one of the greatest childhood books of all time. But the book that I think really stands out in terms of being a groundbreaking book is her book, The Hundred Dresses, Mm -hmm. where she talks about what we would now call maybe bullying or a child peer pressure or being, you know, dependent, you know, Yuri Bronfenbrenner, you know, talks about kind of that teen, that dependency going down to the preschool level, you know, that we make 
when children are around their peers more than their parents, mm-hmm. what happens? And that kind of Yuri Bronfenbrenner calls it social contagion that takes place from you know peer pressure even down into the preschool level. And that's really what the book is about. And it is the most beautifully written, simple, profound book. So I love her. She won the Newbery Award. As so often happens, Sarah, a lot of times an author wins the Newbery Award years after she should have or he should have. And so I think she won it for Ginger Pie, which is a darling book, but she should have won it for the Middle Moffat, in my opinion, or the Hundred Dresses. But Sometimes you earn a medal just out of honoring you at, for your lifelong accomplishments. Interesting. Okay, yeah, that's yeah. good to know. That that makes a lot of sense when I kind of yes. look at Newbery mm-hmm. Awards and think, well, their other yeah. book was better than this one even. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> because maybe they weren't that aware of it back then, but then it rose to the top. And they're like, wow, we kind of missed it. So then they start to pay attention to that author. I so think is a Newbery, this is a good question. I bet a lot of our yeah. listeners have too, which is, is a Newbery Award, is it only for books that were published like that year? Mm-hmm. Oh, it okay. is. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So it's the Newbery is considered the best children's literature for that year in American, in America. It needs to be either an American author or someone residing in America. And then there are British you know, medals as well. And other, there are other medals, but ours is called the Newberry. Okay. And then the best illustrated book by an American author or resident of America is called the Caldcott, as you of course know, but yes. the listeners might not. So those, yes. So those have to be American people to qualify for that medal. I did not realize that. Okay. That's very mm-hmm. helpful to know. Okay. Yeah. So let me jump to another author who I adore as well. And her name is Lois Lenski. (laughs) And I am just in love with her. There's just no other way to describe it. Her Papa, well, her Mr. Small books, like, you know, Policeman Small and Cowboy Small and things like that are just absolutely the most precious books for small children, particularly little boys, just will sleep with them, hug them, kiss them, (laughs) and want you to read them a thousand times. But my favorite of the Mr. Small books is Papa Small, which isn't as well known, but it's a story of Papa Small, obviously, and Mama Small, and then the little children, and they go to church, the baby cries, the baby has to be carried out. On Sunday, Daddy cooks for Mama and the children. Ooh, I like it. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And they all help, you know, which is right up my alley in terms of my whole idea of work and service. And it is the most precious, precious book and probably a little bit harder to find. Some of her books are very, very pricey, you know, to find them used, but see what you can do. But what she's best known for, Sarah, as I'm sure you know, are her regional books. So Strawberry Girl, Cotton in My Sack, Bayou Suzette. And what she did is Lois Lunsky would do this extensive research, and then she would write a book about a regional child. Like, for example, Strawberry Girl is about a family of what are called Florida crackers, which are like native central Floridians. And each of her books, there's one about a little boy in San Francisco who's Chinese. And like I each of her books- I they were based on regions. That is oh, so yeah. cool. Okay. <clears throat> Yes. So each of them, Bayou Suzette is, I think, Louisiana and Cotton in My Sack is in the South, you know, where they're picking cotton as the family. So each child, and then you learn so much about the culture and the region, but her characters are so dear. They're not just two-dimensional paper cutouts, Mm -hmm. but they have, you know, character and feelings and struggles and pain, which is what every child, you know, relates to. Yeah. Yeah. And then probably, you know, on my deathbed, the book I want to be holding is other than the Bible mm-hmm. would be the books by Marguerite D'Angeli. Mm-hmm. And she, to me, personifies this kind of golden age period. She, some of my, she was very prolific. And some of my favorite books are The Hannah and Door in the Wall. But my The book I want your listeners to be aware of, which is a much less known and a little bit harder to find, 
is a book called Bright April. And it's the first children's book that ever dealt with racial prejudice. I've never seen this book. Mm -hmm. It's okay. precious. Okay. And it's about a family in Germantown, Pennsylvania. And they're, you know, lovely and just a charming, fun family, beautifully educated and kind and full of character. And this little girl, April, is the daughter, one of the one of the daughters. She goes to her brownie troop. And there she experiences the very first experience of prejudice that she's had in her life and how her, her mom, especially, you know, handles it. And it's just, it's a lovely, lovely book. And the fun thing about Marguerite D'Angeli, which your listeners might not be aware of, is that she started out as an illustrator of other people's books. And then she decided to start writing her own. And when she would write a book, she would spend a whole year in researching the culture. So it was like the Amish and wow. Yanni Wondernose or Skip Pack School, the German Pennsylvania Dutch, or, you know, whoever she was writing about, she would do extensive research. The Hannah was about Quaker, a Quaker family mm -hmm. during the Civil War period, the Underground Railroad period. So she didn't just, you know, sometimes Ciro we'll see books that are, quote, historic fiction. And all they are is people from our era dressed in costumes. Yeah, basically. exactly. <laughs> so disappointing. Yeah. <laughs> it is so disappointing the way they talk, the way they interact with adults, things that no child in that era would have, I mean, they would have been murdered, you know, by yeah. their parents. But Marguerite D'Angeli, she did her homework. And I just so appreciate her illustrations are magnificent. And she loved the Lord. And she wrote books into her 90s. She lived in Lapeer, Michigan, and they have named the library in Lapeer after her. And my favorite of all of the parts of her books is the beginning of Door in the Wall, where at the, at the kind of dedication page of the book, she has a little door. And then underneath it, she quotes Revelation 3, Behold, I've set before thee an open door and no man can shut it. I know you have a little strength and you have not denied my name. And that is in the, and this was a double day book, Sarah. I mean, this was not a Christian published mm -hmm. book, mm -hmm. but this was the era that these books, the thirties, the forties, the Christian warp and woof as, as Francis Schaeffer talks about it was still so much a part of the publishing world and was so accepted and welcomed in those days. Interesting. Yeah, we miss those days. <laughs> yeah, I've only that's the only book by Marguerite D'Angeli that I've read is oh. um Door in the Wall. And so I just as you were talking, I put the Hannah in my <laughs> in yes. cart and Bright April, but there's only a couple left. So <laughs> Yes. Yes. Well, those are amazing books and then there's Skip Pack School, Yanni Wonder Nose, Henner's Lydia Copper toed boots. I mean, she's a very prolific author. And so once you read one, you're going to want to read everything okay. <laughs> that she ever wrote. And then that brings me to another author from her era. And she was actually a children's editor at Scribner's when Scribner kind of ruled. It was the gold standard of publishers, William Scribner's. She and her name was Alice Dog Leash. Oh, D yes. She's a favorite yeah. of mine. Okay, mm -hmm. go ahead. D-A-L-G-L-I-E-S-H. She was born in Britain, but came to America, I think as a married woman. And uh, she herself was a fabulous author. And she's well known for her book, Bears on Hemlock Mountain, mm -hmm. because I believe that won the Newbery. But I love her historic books. So the Fourth of July story, the mm -hmm. Columbus story, that type of thing. She just wrote history in such a simple, clear way. And, you know, that just brings me to a whole nother principle. And that is I read older books when I'm, you know, reading old history because they tend to be more idealistic, more edifying, more uplifting. And a lot of the living authors, they tend to want to show the warts and the flaws of historic people. And that's fine when you're an adult. But when you're, you know, five years old or seven years old, I think it's very, very important that you just have some. And I think even as adults, Sarah, you and I, we need heroes. We need heroines that we can look up to and our children do as well. Right. And so I love these older books because they are, they're just simple and they're sweet and they're positive. 
That reminds me of something, and I just grabbed it to see if I could find the quote. It's in Anth- Have you read Anthony Eslin's 10 Ways to Destroy the Imagination of Your Child? <laughs> I have heard of that book, okay. and it sounds wonderful. It is. It is totally wonderful. Um, of course, it's written as a satire. So the whole time you're kind of like scratching your head, like, wait, you kind of forget <laughs> which <laughs> viewpoint you're supposed to take. <laughs> but one of the chapters is called Cut All Heroes Down to Size. And he oh. talks about how we destroy our children's imagination when we build in them this habit of sneering at what is great or noble and how, <laughs> oh. here it is, here's the quote, the really oh. effective killer of the moral imagination will want to raise children who snicker at anyone who possesses a remarkable virtue. And he talks about that kind of modern habit we have of wanting to focus on the hero's faults instead yes. of using their strengths to as something to aspire to. So yeah. Yeah. Yes. Oh, I love that. That I couldn't have said it better. Yay. Yeah. Well let me share another team that do exactly what we're talking about. Okay. That is Ingrid and Edgar Perrin Dolaire. Very long names. But Ingrid and Edgar, both European children, they met in art school in Munich and they moved here to America and they wrote some of the most unapologetically patriotic books that I think are in print. And they're so politically incorrect and I adore them. (laughs) They also, of course, were primarily artists. And so what your listeners may not know is that they worked on lithostones. Now, you mentioned that I had a BA in fine arts and I was a student of lithography as part of my college experience. So a litho stone is this massive white stone that's, I mean, it is maybe a foot thick, huge, and it's the top of it is polished, the sides of it are rough, and you draw on it with something greasy like a crayon or like a grease pencil. And then when you ink it, the ink only sticks to the part that has been greased with the pencil, and that is how you create your surface to print from. And so it's incredibly expensive, super, super complex. Nobody would ever use lithography to do illustrations today because it's just out of the reach of you know publishing. But back then, that is how every one of their illustrations was done. That's amazing. Mm-hmm. And um, each the, is cre- the owner of Beautiful Feet Books, which yes. republished the Dolly yes. books, she was on the podcast, Rhea Berg. Um, um, we'll find that a, episode and make sure it's linked in the show notes because she talks about meeting yes. the chat son. Yes, of, son. Yes. yes. And I just thought, oh my goodness, this is amazing. Yeah. Isn't it? And they wrote a book about him. Yes. Yeah. I mean, it, they're just an amazing couple and I collect their books like a maniac. I love, of course, their Greek myths book, which I always talk about in my seminars Obviously, it needs to be read when your children are about nine or 10 and up, not to a, you know, a four-year-old. They don't need to be burdened with that confusion. But the, it is the best book on mythology for your older kids anywhere. And they're just, there's no one quite like them. Now, I mentioned Alice Dalgleish, mm-hmm. and she discovered someone who I consider one of the greats. And Rhea and Russ also have republished her books. And that is Genevieve Foster. Oh, yes. Yes. So Genevieve Foster lived in Evanston, Illinois. She had a son and a daughter. And when they would bring home their school books, their history books, she would just, you know, kind of roll her eyes and shake her head and think, these are so lame. And you would think that the world, you know, began in 1492 and that the map of the world consists of America. And so Genevieve Foster decided to write a book for her own children. And that was George Washington's world. Excuse me. And then she went on to write the world of Abraham Lincoln, the world of Captain John Smith, the world of Columbus and his sons, and the world of William Penn and Augustus Caesar as well. So those were her world of books. And then she also wrote some others. But what I love about those books, Sarah, is A, she illustrated them all herself. I mean, this is unheard of. These people are Renaissance people. They're writing life-changing books, but they're also illustrating them. I mean, who does things like that today? Right. (laughs) And what she did, Sarah, as I'm sure you're well aware of, is she brought in the entire world's history. So she would use a famous person, let's say Abraham Lincoln. Okay, here he is. He's being born in his little, you know, soddy or log cabin. And then this is going on in his life. 
But then this is going on in France and this is going on in China and this is going on in Africa. And she goes on, okay, now Abraham Lincoln is walking and putting pranks on his, you know, precious stepmother who was so good to him. And and this is going on in his life, but now this is going on in England and this is going on in Germany. And so she gives you this worldview and she uses a famous person as the springboard to do that. So it gives you kind of a framework. This is his lifetime, but the world doesn't revolve around the United States. I love this so much because I think it's so refreshing when I'm reading with my kids about history to paint a picture of the whole world. And then it also makes more sense as to why was this happening? You know, can mm. you really understand the American Revolution if you don't know what was happening in Europe at the same time? Exactly. You yeah. got it, Sarah. You got it. So, Sarah, I thought it would be great to talk about Howard Pyle, who to me is kind of the gold standard of American illustrators. And his life and work is really the cornerstone of what many people call the golden age of children's literature. So he was born in Wilmington, Delaware, and his mother read them classics, folklore, mythology. She bought beautiful books for her children with fabulous illustrations and really exposed them to a lot of British, you know, publications. And he drew his whole life. Like in his school books, he would draw in all the margins. And he went to a <laughs> he went to a Quaker school and then he studied art in Philadelphia and he wrote his first book in 1876. But he wrote his book on Robin Hood in 1883. And when he designed a book, he designed the typeface, the binding, the illustrations, and the text, and then wrote the book. Can you? Wow, I mean, a total yeah. Renaissance man. Yeah, yeah. It's I can't amazing. even imagine the scope of a project like that. I can't either. I yeah. mean, so some of his books, which our son just loves so much, things like The Wonder Clock and Salt and Pepper. And then, of course, he did all the King Arthur books, Robin Hood. But my favorite is Otto of the Silver Hand, mm, yes. which I consider his masterpiece. But in addition to being an incredible contributor to you know the annals of children's literature, he started an art school. And at his art school and some of the students that he influenced are some of the greatest illustrators of all time for children. One is N.C. Wyeth, who is Andrew Wyeth's father and Jamie Wyeth's grandfather. Okay. And N.C. Wyeth homeschooled all of his children and his grandchildren, and he would dress all of them in costumes and make them pose for his illustrations. He always drew from models, and he had these fabulous, fabulous costumes that he collected, you know, all through his career. <laughs> and then <laughs> and then Maxfield Parrish, who is probably not as well known today, but was considered one of the greatest illustrators of all times. Okay. And then my beloved Jesse Wilcox Smith, who I have always used as kind of my trademark. So all of these people studied under Howard Pyle at his school, and it was called the Brandywine School, and it was in Pennsylvania, and a huge contributor to what we consider the greatest children's illustration period, the, that, golden, that golden age. Another author I wanted to talk about who is also a fabulous illustrator is James Doherty. That James name does not, I don't, I think it's familiar really? to me. Maybe James I recognize Doherty. the art. Okay, yeah. 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 So James Doherty has written some historic biographies, like one on Daniel Boone, one on Ben Franklin. But the one that I just love the best is Andy and the Lion. Oh, which yes. Is yes. The story of Andrew, Andrew Cleese and the Lion. And he was an illustrator that I feel every little boy will connect with and relate to because his illustrations feel like they're going to jump off the page and punch you in the nose. <laughs> they are so full of masculinity and power and energy. And they're just delightful is the only way that I can describe him. And he was a wonderful, wonderful writer and children, especially boys. I always recommend James Doherty's books for boys. Oh, the Magna Charta. Yes. I'm looking at them online right. now to figure it out. Okay. That's yes. Right. I do recognize but, his work. Yes, exactly. Okay. So his books are great. His illustrations are superb. 
And then an Asian artist that I just really feel so fond of is a gentleman named Taro Yashima, Y-A-S-H-I-M-A. Okay. And he's best known for his award-winning book, Crow Boy, but he also wrote the sweetest book about his daughter named Umbrella. The book is named Umbrella. And it's a story of a little girl who is given an umbrella and some rubber boots and they live in a city. And for some reason, after she's given these gifts, it never rains. And her name is Momo. And every day she looks out the window, hoping it's going to rain and, you know, tries on her boots and walks around with the umbrella in the sunshine. (laughs) And then, you know, one day finally it rains. And it's a story of her daddy, you know, and he picks her up, I believe it was from the library. And they walk home together in the rain, she with her boots and her umbrella. And the daddy, who's the narrator, says, it was the first day that Momo didn't hold his hand. Oh, It was like a rite of passage and kind of, you know, a daddy and a daughter. And Yashima's illustrations are so sensitive, so brilliant. Crow Boy, again, is about that peer kind of bullying, rejection, not fitting in. And it's about a little boy in Japan who lives way, way out in the country, in the mountains. And all of the city students kind of think he's, you know, kind of a loser. But they get a new headmaster who realizes the amazing gifts and talents that reside in this little boy. And he can imitate all the different calls of the crows that live in the mountains. Mm. And at the end of the school year, the teacher asks him to come up and perform. And all the children are like that loser. And he gets up and they're just wowed. They're just Mm. bowled over by his gifts and his abilities. And they see him in a whole different light. And it's just so helpful as we're building character into our children These are the type of books without, you know, making a sermonette out of it and getting all annoying with our teacher voice, but just letting the Holy Spirit work in our children's lives. And as Charlotte Mason used to talk about treating our children with respect, knowing that they can figure things out for themselves. You don't have to chew it up and, you know, pre-digest it for your children. But she said, leave your children alone with great authors. And anything else would be to uh, exert undue influence. Like just leave them alone. Don't analyze, don't dissect, don't make school out of books. Save that for college. If they're raised loving books and loving, you know, authors and illustrators, when they get to college, trust me, they will ace all of their literature courses. So many people think, well, they won't know what to do. No, it's just the opposite. If you burn them out, they will never love literature. That will make it the kiss of death. But if you let them fall in love with literature, when they get older, they will be able to do all that, you know, mindless stuff that, you know, we do in college and it's fine, but we want them to fall in love with books first. So good. Oh my goodness. That's solid gold right there. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) And then may I talk about one last author and then... Yes, I would love... Yes, absolutely. All right. So the last author is someone who is very, very near and dear to my heart. And the reason is that, Sarah, I was raised in a non-believing home and I was not read to ever in my whole life. And my mom is a very, very intelligent woman and very articulate, amazing vocabulary, studied four languages. But in our culture and, you know, back in, in the 50s and 60s, it just wasn't normally done where people didn't read a lot to children, unfortunately. And so when I had the flu one day as a probably a preteen, I begged my mother to go to the public library and get me something to read because I was always complaining that there was nothing to read because I read from morning until night. I read practically in the shower. Like I just read all the time. You, know? <laughs> you and my 12 year old are like kindred spirits, I think. <laughs> If she could figure out a way to read in the shower, she would. (laughs) I know. Would you tell her we need to talk? Because we need to figure this out. But anyway, so my mom came back from the library where she had gone under duress because my mother didn't go to the library for herself. She came back with this green book, handed it to me and said, this is a book I read when I was your age. And I thought, 
oh my word. I mean, this wasn't, you know, we didn't have literary conversations. So I began to read it and I fell wildly in love with the book. It was so, I read constantly, but I had no guidance. I would literally go to the public library and just read the whole section of B. And then I'd read the whole section of C. I mean, and these were adult books. I was so not reading appropriately, but I just read all, you know, I couldn't get enough. I was like a starving Armenian. So having said that, (laughs) when I read this book, after reading the dribble that, you know, who knows what I've been reading, it was like someone finally gave me, you know, my first glass of real water. And so it went back to the library. And that's why it's so important to own the right books, because it went back to the library. And the rest of my life into my adulthood, I was searching for this book. And I would say to people, well, this girl lives really far away from school and she has a lunch pail with a custard cup. And they would look at me like, we don't know what you're talking about. And so one day I was reading Edith Schaefer and she was talking about some of her favorite books. And she mentions this book, Girl of the Limberlost. And I just screamed and I said, that's the green book. And I drove to the Newport Children's Bookshop in Newport Beach that was owned by a woman who you would have loved. Her name is Sarah Brandt. It's of course no longer there, but I drove there at 90 miles an hour. They had a copy of it. I brought it home. I felt like I was reconnected with my twin who I'd been separated from birth. Oh, Oh, it was such a wonderful experience. So then I was told by a friend years later, I, we were talking about books and I said that that was my favorite book. And She said, well, have you read Freckles? It's even better. And I kind of went, excuse me, but there is nothing better than Girl (laughs) of the Limberlost. So then I went to our library and of course they didn't have room for these books because they have to have, you know, really important people like Danielle Steele. And so, you know, they didn't even exist in our library. And I went on these massive searches and by the grace of God, you know, University of Indiana has begun, began then at that point to reprint her books. So the author I'm talking about is, Geneva was really her name, but her pen name was Jean, G-E-N-E, Jean Stratton Porter. Yes. And she lived in Indiana and they, she really started her career as a photographer and a writer of nature books, but her publisher was frustrated that her books really didn't sell very well. And so she started to write fiction for which we are all so grateful. And she combined nature in all of her books. So she kind of hid that spoonful of sugar, you know, the medicine and the spoonful of sugar, I should say. And she wrote some of the best selling books of her era anywhere. And they, 10 of her books were made into movies. She was extremely successful and popular. And all of her books, I can remember recommending Laddie to someone. And they said to me, I felt like I had gone to Sunday school after I read that book. I was so edified. I was so blessed. And yet there's no preachiness. Jean Stratton Porter was the baby of 13 children. And her father was a farmer, but he was a man of the word. And he memorized the entire Bible. And he, um, yes, the entire Bible. And he would be invited to speak places and he would say to them, well, I've memorized all of scripture except the begats. Uh, He said, those are just not worth my brain power, you know, to to memorize those. (laughs) Right. So he would be invited to a church and they would say first Timothy and bam, or second Samuel and off he would go. And he memorized the whole thing. And when she was a little girl, she was the baby in the family of a big farming family. Her father told her mother, I want you, she's kind of high strung or she's very sensitive. I just want you to let her run wild like a little lamb. And so even though the other girls were forced to sit inside and sew and do things like that, Jean Stratton Porter, Geneva, was just allowed to run in nature. And she had an older brother and his name was Laddie. And so she, he was tragically killed, I believe, in a car accident. But she wrote a book about her childhood, which is Laddie, and it's autobiographical. And then I consider her all-time masterpiece to be Keeper of the Bees, which is the only one of her books set in California. She eventually moved to California to write for Hollywood, and she was sadly killed. I believe it was in a train accident. Oh, sad. Mm -hmm. But I have gone on record recommending to families that if they have to pay their children $100 Mm -hmm. to read her books, it will be the best money you ever spend. They are life-changing character building books. And I read them over and over again, which to me is the test of a good book. I read the same books over and over again. Over again. (laughs) 
my 14 year old has in our homeschool group there as a group of girls that has a book club. They just kind of organized it themselves. And right now they're all reading A Daughter of the Land by Jean Stratton Porter. And so I don't know if she I don't think she's quite finished it yet. I think they're finishing it this month and then next month they're going to have their little group meeting where they get to talk about it. Yeah. Now that I'm sad to say, don't tell her I said this, but that is my least favorite of her books. That's interesting because she told me she's a pretty voracious reader. I know she's read, is it Freckles? She's read some other works by Jean Stratton Porter. And she said this one is fairly slow. I think she's been a little yeah. disappointed in it, actually. But Yeah. And uh, there's some things in it that really are grievous to the Holy Spirit. In my opinion, there's okay. some. Yeah. Okay. So I don't but recommend Keeper of the that. Bees. I should grab Keeper of the oh. Bees for her. Okay. Oh, yes. A friend just called me and said, Carol, I finally just read it. Oh, my word. When our son read it, it's so funny. I really felt that he was supposed to read it. I felt impressed of the Lord, actually, that he was supposed to read it. And he was getting ready to leave for Bible college at Calvary Chapel Bible College. And I said, JJ, I really feel like you're supposed to read this book. And he was like, OK, OK, I will. But at the time, believe it or not, he was reading Crime and Punishment, which I have never read. Yeah. And he was really, it, you know, it's work to read Crime and Punishment. <laughs> so he kind of like, OK, mom, I'll get to that. But right now I'm kind of busy. So it was getting ready, you know, school was ending and his life was kind of making a change. And so he took the book, he read it. And when he finished it, he said, mom, you were right. Thank you. Oh, wow. I mean, it, yeah, it's a life changer. Really well, I'm just is. reading the description of it because I'm putting it in my Amazon cart as we're talking. Oh, and it says okay. it's the very last novel she wrote before her death, which yes. kind of makes sense that it would be this culminating masterpiece. That's right. That's exactly right. A book that examines the healing power that nature and kindness can have Mm -hmm. upon someone's life. That's how it's described. Yes. You know, I worked uh, for many years with a family in Minnesota and the husband was a stockbroker. And he came up to me where I was speaking one time. They always came to our seminars. And he he held the book up against his chest and he said that the name of the the, uh, star of the book is Jamie McFarland. And he said... He pointed to the book and he said, this is who I want to grow up to be. And then at Christmas time, he asked me to send him a case of those books to give to everyone in his stock brokerage firm. This is the thing. I mean, she is a master, truly a master, but it's a character. This is what character looks like, is what I could say over each one of her books. We'll put links to... A lot of Jean Stratton Porter's books right there in the show notes. So if you are listening to this and think, oh my goodness, I need to get my hands on some of these, head to readaloudrevival.com and look for episode 51. Well, this is beautiful. Carol, is there anything? Actually, I have another question. Yes. If someone is listening today and they wonder how they can start living this reading life with their kids, what is the number one thing you would tell her? Hmm. Well, the number one thing I'd tell her is to unplug her family. Because as long as electronics are competing for your children's heart and mind, you're fighting a battle that you probably will never win. Mm -hmm. So I hate to say it, but in my seminars, we spend a great deal of time talking about that and giving research from everyone and their brother from the American Association of Pediatricians on down. And they're all saying the same thing. Screens are not your children's friends. If you want them to be intelligent and personally for me, if you want them to be godly. Yeah. So, I, the- I had Dr. Daniel Willingham on the show and episode 43. He wrote the book Raising Kids Who Read just recently, mm-hmm. just came out earlier this year. And or maybe it was last year. Anyway, one of the things he said was that if he was to offer his children watermelon for dessert, they would be happy because they enjoy watermelon. It's sweet and they like it. But if he was to say you could have watermelon or you can have candy, it would be very hard for them to choose the watermelon. And he said, that's what happens when we make our children choose between reading and screens that we need to make that choice for them because, you know, we're human (laughs) and they're, Uh, you know, humans in training. (laughs) Really? That is a really, really good word picture. Thank you for sharing that. I'm going to steal that if you don't mind. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. (laughs) Because that is really, really helpful. So that's the first thing I'd say to a mom. And then the second thing, and to a dad especially, is read to your children from the moment they're conceived until the night before they get married and every day in between. Mm. They're never too young. They're never too old to be read to and make it the high point of your day. Let your children associate being read to with rewards and never punishment. You know, you get to be read to. You've been so good today. 
that daddy's going to read two chapters to you instead of one tonight when we read as a family. I love so, that so much. It's yeah. so different from the the culture or the you know summer reading programs that say <laughs> if you read this many books, you will get a prize. Uh, exactly. Especially like you will get a prize like an iPad. You're like, what? <laughs> Um, so oh, it's no. like, you know, when you yeah. say use the reading itself as the reward, that's so yeah. wonderful. I love it. Yes. Yeah. Thank you so much. I am just so grateful for your work mm-hmm. and for blessing us here. Yeah. And I know our listeners are going to be blessed by what you've shared. And I appreciate yeah. you giving your time to us today. My pleasure. Can I share one more thing that we're um, working on? Absolutely. At- yes. Okay, great. So as we speak, Sarah, I am creating a history of children's lit course. And it's uh, by the time that this segment plays, it will be on our web store at caroljoyside.com. And it's going to be called history of children's lit subtitled Carol's great books course. Oh my goodness. Uh huh. (laughs) I'm going to take this. I'm so excited. I'm like jumping out of my seat. (laughs) So this is really going to be kind of the culmination of my life's you know, passion and everything that I've loved and lived for all these years, I'm going to do it, you know, like if you took a kitty lit course in a college, as I did when I was in graduate school, I had a teacher that, I mean, we were kindred spirits, but when she started quoting A.A. A. Milne poems and things, and I just wanted to just jump up and hug her and kiss her on both cheeks. And just the power that a children's lit course can empower people with. So they feel knowledgeable. They walk into a library, they're making out the Christmas wish list for grandmas, you know, for Christmas that I want to equip families so they know as much about children's literature as I do. Mm. And that's, that's our goal. And that's, that's what we're working on as we speak. I am so excited about that. I am definitely going to take your course. We will make sure there is a link in the show notes at episode 51. So if you're listening to this and think I need to learn more from Carol, especially because she's Mm -hmm. such a joyful, enthusiastic teacher, head to readaloudrevival.com. Look for episode 51 and we'll have a direct link to her course there where you can go to caroljoyside.com, which is C-A-R-O-L-E-S-E-I-D. Actually, is it carolside.com. You're right. No, oh. Carol Joy Side. I'm sorry. caroljoyside.com. You got it. You okay. said it. Perfect. Yeah. Excellent. Perfect. We are absolutely thrilled to share that because I know I'm going to want to take that. As you are talking about these authors, these children's authors, I was making myself a note on the page. Like <laughs> I need to learn more about these children's book authors. This is magnificent. So you've oh, made it so easy for me. <laughs> I'm so glad. Yay. Well, you are my sister separated at birth. I think Sarah, you're just such a kindred spirit, and you are doing kingdom work. And I just praise God for what you're doing. Now it's time for Let the Kids Speak. This is my favorite part of the podcast, where kids tell us about their favorite stories that have been read aloud to them. My name is Sophia, and I'm three years old. And I'm from Missouri, and I'm three years old, and my favorite book is Runaway Hug. And he's a dog that gives a peanut butter we hug. That's my favorite part. Hi, my name is Jonah, and I am seven years old. I live in Louisville, Kentucky, and my favorite book that I like to be read to is called The Case of the Missing Rubber Ducky by Linda Hayward. My favorite part is the part where Sherlock Hemlock gets the rubber ducky mixed up with the rubber ball, the rubber glove, the rubber rafts, the rubber stamp, and Bert's rubber band collection. I am Felicity, and I'm nine years old, and I live in the sweetest place on Earth, Hershey, Pennsylvania. I would like to tell you about the water horse. The water horse is about two children that find an egg. Turns out to be a water horse egg, and they have great adventures. I would also like to tell you about the Willoughbys. The parents and the children don't really prefer each other, but don't be worried. It's very funny, and it's comedy, and it had a very happy ending, and it was my favorite read-aloud of this year. Thank you. Goodbye. Hello. My name is Mercy, and I'm five years old. I live in Hershey, Pennsylvania, and I like the Moffats. 
I like the beginning chapter and the last chapter, and also one of my other favorite chapters was the chapter with the kitty. I also like the water horse. It's about these two kids that live by the ocean. They find this egg, and it turns out to be a water horse egg. A water horse is kind of like the Loch Ness monster, and it is a sea monster. And they have tons of happy adventures with it. And we read it in one day. Hi, my name is Edward Bolton. I am seven years old, and I live in Alberta, Canada. And my favorite book is The Green Amber because of all the excitement and the adventure that Pickett and Heather have. Hello, my name is Charity, and I'm from Florida, and I'm eight years old. My favorite book is Monsieur Chantique, and I love and when he jumped out of the boat and swam to keep the her up and have air, so she went sink in the water. And I also love about it. after the book. I had a dream about Misty and the Phantom. Hello, my name is Sarah. I'm nine years old, and and I'd like to tell you about the Green Ember. The Green Ember has great characters, and Piggy. At first, he's a scaredy cat, but he saves someone. But I don't want to tell you because I want you to read the book. Hi, my name is Lucy Boyd. I am ten years old, and I live in Chicago. My favorite book is Smile by Raina Tugmeyer. My favorite character is Raina. I like her because she has a little sister just like mine. My favorite part in the book is when she's getting ready for high school. My name's Alec. How old are you? Three. You're three. What's your favorite book? Mike Mulligan and the Steam Shovel. Mike Mulligan and the Steam Shovel. Why do you like that book? Because it has the steam shovel in it. What's your favorite part? Favorite part is they dig a hole. If they dig a hole. Thank you for your messages, kids. I love those. Your kids can leave their own message for the podcast at readaloudrevival.com. I bet you'll be surprised at just how easy it is to leave that message. You can do it from your phone, your computer, your iPad, just about any device you want. It's as easy as the click of a button. Thank you so much for joining me today. This has been fantastic. Hey, don't forget to go to Instagram to follow the Read Aloud Revival and Grace Laced so you don't miss out on our awesome giveaway and all of our upcoming giveaways as well. In two weeks, I'll be back with Trisha Goyer. We're going to be talking on episode 52 all about how she has bonded with some of her adopted children through reading aloud and really just kind of the deep heart connections that sharing books with our kids uh, lets happen. So I'm really excited for that conversation. I'll see you in two weeks. Until that time, go build your family culture around books. Thank you.